the Steve Dangle Podcast. Powered by Sports Interaction. Want to bet? D-P-P. The Steve Dangle Podcast. With your host, Steve Dangle, Adam Wilde, and Jesse Blake. I'm a... Um, Hot guy. I'm, I'm just wondering. A big ass man. <laughs> a guy with a handsome face. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I was putting this show together and I was wondering where the hell to start. And I think, you know, the way our last show ended, we knew that um, Shanahan was going to give a press conference at three o'clock. The Kyle Dubas news broke in the show. Uh, and then it was sort of like, oh, great. Now we're going to get a long weekend press release, news dump or whatever. And we didn't get that. We actually got Shanahan. Yep. And on my drive up to uh, my wife's family cottage, we listened to it. And my daughter was in the in the back going like, daddy, daddy. I'm like, I'm like, Everly, <laughs> I love you so much. But you, you got it. You got to put a sock in it at the moment. Shanahan's talking. Darth Vader's Un- talking. Uncle Brendan. Uncle Brendan is talking. And I, I think... Uh, what unfolded after that, and I, I'm listening to people who, who do this for a living. You know, we look at press conferences, we break them down. Steve's been to a few, uh, and I've been to, I went to a Dolly Parton press conference once. That's, uh, that's as close as I've been to a real press really? conference. Yeah. I, I, Have you met Dolly Parton? I inter- met and interviewed her afterwards. Have you shook her hand? Yes. <gasps> and she's amazing. Hilarious. That's unreal. How's her handshake? Uh, strong. Strong, but like not too strong. Didn't crush your fingers. I believe you. Yeah, no, she's awesome. Okay. I had sweaty hands. She didn't. It was great. Uh, but she's charming and amazing. Royal. Um, do, I wish that Brendan could handle the press conference the way Dolly Parton could. Cannot. Uh, but it doesn't mean that it was bad. It, it was some of the most captivating sports drama I think any of us have ever seen. And I'll tell you, all the reporters down there in every single article that I read said, I've never seen anything like this before in not so many words. So... I think we start from the beginning uh, with the new face of the Toronto Maple Leafs. And whether or not huh. you want this to be the case, the new GM is not the face of the Leafs. Uh, the new, the current or new coach, you know, whether it's key for somebody else, will not be the face. The players are no longer the face. Success or failure, Brendan Shanahan, because of this press conference, is the fra- face of the franchise, and he will be the one wearing this. We're and back to the Shanna plan. You will. You don't get to go on TV. And say the things that he said, rightly or wrongly, whether you're Team Shanahan or Team Dubas or somewhere in the middle. And we'll talk about it. Um, you don't get to do that and not be the face of this. And I don't know. He doesn't do many, many media avails, but he might have to start doing more because uh, he's just put himself in a territory a la Masai Ujiri. Uh, b- but <laughs> without the success, without the success or the trade leading up to it. Because remember, Masai was under some heat, too, when the Raptors got LeBron toed. So let's get into it. Jesse, can you fire up the beginning of this press conference? We're not going to go through the whole thing, but I think it's important we hear Shani's timeline of events again. For a lot of us, it's been three or four days. Uh, last off season, uh, I approached Kyle uh, in his office at the Ford Performance Center and explained to him that he would be not receiving a contract offer prior to his final year of his contract. Um, I tried to reassure him that that it wasn't a reflection on his future with the club. I reminded him that it was a situation I found myself in a few years prior as well, and that it was my hope and it was my intention that at the end of the year and after being judged for the full five, year of his, five years of his contract, that we would be extending him and mo- moving forward. Kyle took it very well. I thought he was a pro. He addressed that in the uh, in his uh, opening season statements that he was comfortable with that, and I thought that he had done an excellent job. Um, I thought Kyle had a great off season. Uh, we had some difficult choices to make. Um, if if you're judging him on on the work he did last summer, some of the decisions of letting players go, of signing some players, I think it's a challenging job for any general manager. And I think Kyle did an excellent job. We came into the season very well organized. Many options. I thought the team, typical season of highs and lows, but had an excellent regular season. Um, going throughout the year, um, the way that the team was managed, I had no issue with that. As a matter of fact, I thought that, again, Kyle did an excellent job. Uh, the trade deadline, um, 
again, going back to his process and the way that our team does this here under his leadership, there's a, there's a lot of input. And I thought that he made some very good moves. And I thought he had prepared the team um, to the best of his ability, as any GM can do after the trade deadline. There's not as much for a GM to do. So it was important for me shortly after the trade deadline, around the middle of March, I approached Kyle in his office at Ford Performance Center and told him that I had seen enough in my mind that I had wanted him to be our general manager going forward, but that he should go home and take some time to think about it. And if he was comfortable with that idea, I would start talking to ownership about that. Kyle appreciated that. Um, we've, we had a good relationship the whole year. That day was nothing different. Um, he came back to me about a week later and said yes, that, that he was comfortable moving forward. And he gave me the name of his agent, or he said his agent would reach out to me, but that he didn't want this to be a distraction for him. And I respected his wishes that I wasn't going to discuss it with him uh, any further at that point. So. Um, fast forward to the end of the season, getting through the end of the regular season, the playoffs. I had many good conversations with Kyle's agent, uh, felt we were making progress. I wanted to be in a position so to a to respect Kyle's wishes and not discuss this with him as it was going along. Uh, but I knew his agent from time to time was giving him updates. That was that's really up to them. I, I don't know exactly what was going on there. Um, but I felt those conversations, which were productive, had put me in a position that when the season ended, um, or even if it was between rounds, um, because at a certain point I felt either if, however round two ended, even if we were moving on to round three, that this was something that needed attention now. And I felt that those conversations and the communications I got from Kyle had put me in a position where I could um, come to him with something that was pretty much a finished deal um, that reflected what he wanted financially and what he wanted as a general manager, what was important to him. Um, when the season did end, unfortunately, abruptly, um, it was very important to me that I was ready to go early. I expressed to Kyle that night that as disappointed as we all were, I thought he had done a good job. Um, it's, it's a tough time for the players. It's a tough time for Management, it's a tough time for all of us. It's a tough time for Maple Leaf fans in those, in, in those moments after a loss. Uh, but we had a day off on Saturday. We communicated a little bit through text on, uh, on Sunday. We had a team photo here. We went up to my office. I uh, had another good conversation with Kyle. I, I presented him with what I thought was a framework that reflected what his agent and I had talked to and a good finishing. So, so I want you to really tune in here because this is where it starts to get interesting. You've got Shanahan saying, I presented him with a, con a, 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 a contract and that he thought was along the lines of what Kyle's agent uh, and, and Shani had talked about before. Okay, this is really, really where it gets to be important. Continue. In place in the uh, effort to to get this done as soon as possible. Um, and Kyle took it, he seemed fine, or he seemed uh, pleased to, to receive that news so quickly. We then talked about the hockey team for another couple of hours and we went home. And we knew the next day we were having exit physicals and media. We talked a little bit about doing media. I had expressed to him that I was it was not my intention to talk to the media until I had something settled with him. Um, I expressed that it, I thought it was maybe a good idea if he didn't either, but Kyle said he really wanted to talk to the media and, and, and I respected that. He, uh, he felt that he, his players were speaking, his coach was speaking, and that he should as well, and I respected his wishes. So um, the next day when, you know, and, and, and let me go back. I would also say part of our conversation in my office was that this was hard on his family. In fairness, we talked about that. How, quite frankly, it's 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 hard on all our families. We it's it's a difficult thing. It's hard on the players, um, the parents. But it, it's it's the job we choose. It's the sport we choose. We're we're very fortunate to be in it. But it it does not come without a toll on the families. And I completely acknowledge that. 
And uh, we talked a little bit about that. Um, the next day, though, I would say when after, while watching Kyle's press, um, I, I think at that point, it, there was a shift in, in, in my thinking at that moment, a dramatical shift in my thinking as I drove home that night that, as Kyle expressed, he might not want to be our GM. And I have to take that very seriously. Um, I, as I had said to him the day before, I, I, I understood those feelings and the pressure and the pressure that players are under, the pressure that management, coaches, uh, family members are under. Um, but it was a very real possibility for me at that point that I would be needing to look somewhere else. Okay, so let's hold there for a second. So let's recap for just a second, and then I'm going to let him finish. Um, so what we find out is that Dubas is not going to be signed to an extension last summer. He's comfortable with that. He goes through the year. Shannon's happy with his moves in the summer. He's happy with the team he ices. He's happy with the trade deadline. And around the trade deadline, Shani goes to Dubas. Do you want to stick around? Dubas said yes. Then he's going to go to management and try to convince the board, which we found out with CJ last week on our show, that, you know, Rogers and Bell were not on board with this, allegedly. Uh, Larry Tannenbaum had wanted to extend him the entire time. Shanahan's job is then, as the co-governor and president, uh, is to go to the board and say, here's why I believe this person should stick around. Let's look at the entirety of his deal, not just this season. Although it did seem a lot like... They were measuring it just on this season. Um, and they get he gets the board approval and then negotiates with the agent, pre presents a contract. And so all of that effort and all of that time leads up to the Leafs going, this is the guy we want. And what you're about to hear is how over 72 hours, an entire year's worth of decision making a very deliberately long timeline is undone. So he's, let's keep going. He's done nothing. He said nothing other than Dubas has done a good job so far. And it's as part of my job, that is what I began to do while still hoping that Kyle and I could come to some sort of a resolution. What I would say then was in the next few days, um, I didn't get any more clarity. Um, Tuesday, uh, Wednesday, um, Tuesday, Kyle and I did not meet privately. Um, on, on Wednesday, we did meet privately and we discussed this again for a long time. Um, I had probably more questions than answers and I did not have clarity. It further made me feel that there's a strong possibility that that rightfully anyone's uh, right to do so, he might not want to be the general manager of the Toronto Maple Leafs. So my focus then again uh, continued toward the path of what do we look like next year with a different general manager. Um, to Thursday, the next day, uh, Kyle had said uh, that his agent was going to call me and that he would reach out to me as well. Uh, I got a call in the afternoon from his agent and uh, basically a, a new financial package was presented to me by the agent. Um, the conversation was brief. I did not hear from Kyle throughout the day and I went home and just before dinner time, I got an email from Kyle saying that he did want to be the, uh, the general manager of the Maple Leafs. At that point, I have to, if I'm being honest, I, I was, I had gotten to a different place about how I felt about the future of the Toronto Maple Leafs and what was best. And as hard as it was and as hard as, as it is to make a significant change to somebody that you're close to and that you've been working with for nine years, I, even though I was presented with um, well, a gap had risen within the contract status, and um, but nevertheless, uh, the email that I received from Kyle, I, I, I just felt differently, and I felt that the long-term future of the Maple Leafs might have to change. And uh, 
slept on that. So, uh, so then Shanahan goes on to say that he went into Kyle's office at the Ford Performance Center and told him that uh, they were going to go in a separate direction. And which he named the Ford Performance Center three separate times during that statement. It's good state. It's it's good brand. Which I found like. Was Ford pressuring him to get reads in or was he 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 very deliberately paints a picture Mm -hmm. here. He wants you to envision everything that happened and he wants it ingrained in your mind. And I think that's part of the reason so many people have taken this as 100 percent gospel. The other reason is Dubas hasn't said anything. And right before the show, Dubas released a statement that I still haven't read. Go ahead and read it. Okay. Funny. You want me to read it and have you react or are you going to be able to react on the fly? What do you think? I'm going to be able to react okay, on go, the fly. Go. So this is Kyle Dubas and his family have released a statement uh, following his departure from the Maple Leafs. I got this from Sportsnet's uh, Instagram. It's, he posted it himself. Oh, well, then. Yeah, he tweeted it out from at Kyle Dubas. It's not yeah. from Sportsnet. Pretty good oh. way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> While I understand there is interest surrounding the circumstances of my departure, I will not get into the specifics of what I consider to be reasonable and consistent but private discussions. In the days that I felt I needed to assess and evaluate my own view to the future, both with respect to the necessary direction of the club and ensuring that I had the full support of my family for what I knew would be required in the off season and years to follow the organization as is their right to do decided to go in a different direction in the nine seasons since being afforded the opportunity to work in the national hockey league for the Toronto Maple Leafs, We have had the chance to learn a lot and have grown significantly through the ups and downs. We have watched our family double in size while developing meaningful relationships, which will last a lifetime. It was an honor to be able to work in such an inspiring place with dedicated, loyal people and an extremely passionate fan base. The impact of that and the relationships with all of the people at MLSE from the board of directors through to the ushers at Scotiabank Arena will forever hold a dear place in our hearts. To the players, coaches, and staff at the facility each day, past and present, thank you for your passion and commitment to every step of the journey together. It was a tremendous pleasure to work alongside you each day. We will roll from here. The Dubas family. So the first obvious omission from that is Brandon Shanahan and ownership. The person that, well, MLSE is mentioned. Oh, yeah, that's true. Um, Uh, The people at MLSE, they're not talking about. He's not talking about the guys who signed the checks. He's talking about the employees. Uh, As he should. He says the board of directors. He does say it. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Adam's right. I I don't think. And who am I supposed to interpret this being about well and this other is, than brendan yeah Jones. well and the I one think, guy he didn't name i think that's what it's about <laughs> though and i think that's what i want you to take away from this conversation i started this off and i think steve and jesse know it in their heart of hearts brendan shanahan is now the face of the toronto maple Leafs. welcome to the new era welcome to uh welcome to whatever gm whatever coach whatever players are brought in Shanny's the face of this. Yep. And Dubas was the face. Shanny started as the face. Then he got Dubas to be the face. You know, Lou was in there in the middle. But this is this is for real now. And this is Shanahan's last chance. He, and, and this is where it's what's, what's odd to me. And I'm sure it's odd to Kyle Dubas. His last chance is going to be to fire and then fire everyone and hire all their replacements. Well, it's a bit of a high stakes last chance. I think, I think it's funny And I think it's interesting. And I want to start here. CJ pointed this out in his article uh, for North Star, which is absolutely blistering, by the way. Just an uh, I've never seen like I love CJ's writing anyway. I'm biased, but uh, I've never seen him write anything like this before. And um, what is it? You know, the Leafs are supposed to be or at least they put off this air of uh, we're a process driven organization. Everything we do is very deliberate. We stick to our process, whether the wind's going in our direction or it's not. What is it that makes someone change their mind 
after a plan in place is plan is in place for a year. And I'm speaking specifically about Kyle Dubas's press conference last Monday, where he said this was hard on his family and he'd had to think about it. What Shanahan then outlines, they'd had that conversation the day before. Hey, it was hard on my family. Yeah, me too. You know, it's just a, this is a, this is a demanding job. Mm-hmm. No shit. And he's not doing that for sympathy. I think he's being honest about it. Both guys are being honest about it. But what's interesting for me here is in one press conference, Kyle Dubas was somehow unable or was somehow able to undo the decision decision making process that had been taken up a year in advance. It, they this had been going. He was the guy for the job. And then and they liked the job that he had done prior. And then driving home that night, and Shanahan says this. Fucking Toronto traffic He's, ruins everything. Yeah, maybe it's that. Imagine if he had a short commute. He would he Dubas would still be GM right well, now. Well, that's what he gets the, for Friggin' Gardner. If you live in the West End, that's what you deal with. The West End of Toronto's traffic is horrible. Gardner wrecking the Leafs yet again. But he's saying Sorry. when he drove home that he changed his mind. And I, Jesse, Steve, guys, if you have a decision that's a year in the making, are you going to let uh, you're going to let one press conference or 72 hours completely unravel it? There are, you know, I think I think you've seen my video and uh, I am largely against what Brandon Brendan Shanahan has done. Um, I'm, I'm almost less against the idea of Dubas not being GM anymore um, and more uh, just against the way Brendan Shanahan and everyone, basically everyone above Kyle Dubas has handled this. Um, they thought this guy did a good job. They said he did a good job. Uh, and they thought he was the guy to carry them forward. He had a, be- a bad press conference. And I don't think, and this may be unpopular with some, I don't think Kyle Dubas is blameless here. Um, Nick Kiprios had a very spirited rant about Dubas, you know, used his family in the media. I think that is harsh. Well, he said it, it was as a negotiation tactic is what his words were. I think that's very harsh. Um, and I don't see it that way. I have a hard time believing this fan base would go, you know what? Gosh, I feel so bad for him. Give him some more money. <laughs> like, who is that benefiting? Maybe, How would that work and do maybe his he's, favor? Maybe what, what Kipper is thinking is, you know, the absence of something makes it more valuable, right? So maybe Kyle, in, in Kipper's mind here, and this is, again, it was right after the press conference, right? So, yeah. you know, you're going off of what he knows at that moment. So I'm giving Nick that for sure, where he's saying, well, I'm not going to go anywhere else, but I may just not want to do this for a little bit. Kind of in, in, in certain circles, people would see that as a way of jacking up your value. I think that's his. Well, but then he completely takes a negotiating ploy off the table for himself in that very same press conference by saying, I don't have it in me to go anywhere else. Right. So if if the goal was to jack up the price, say, yeah, I could go anywhere. Is, isn't that the ploy? Isn't that the move? Yeah, there's 31 other teams that would be happy to have me. Now, obviously, you can't get in front of the microphone and say that because the Leafs will say, all right, we'll go and find them. But he said in front of a microphone, uh, there's lots of other teams. Now, he's and, and I know we're going to get to this. He's been granted permission to speak to the Pittsburgh Penguins. He can do whatever he wants with his life and who would turn down an excellent role uh, with an excellent organization and an excellent ownership group. But if he takes that job, he's going to look foolish. You just told us you weren't going to go anywhere. You didn't have it in yourself. Well, as we've seen, though, over 72 hours, things can change. A lot of things can change, but you specifically said and and you didn't you didn't like put a contingent on it. It was just it. I read it and I think most people read it as I'm either going to be the GM of the Leafs next year or I won't be a GM in the NHL for now, for now. Uh, So if he ends up going to the Penguins or some other team after saying that, yeah, I think he's going to look a little foolish. Um, I think Brendan Shanahan and the board were caught off guard by the fact Dubas was even using an agent like because again and there's there's a reason i pointed out the ford performance center stuff i think brendan shanahan was very deliberate uh painting a picture and there are little breadcrumbs throughout um 
Elliot Friedman noted that Rogers or the telecom brass do not like surprise last minute changes in contract. Well, that's no, no kidding. I've worked for both of them. They don't. It, it, yeah. Tell me about it. So, oh boy. Um, so they don't like that. Brendan Shanahan in that statement mentioned that Dubas gave Shanny his agent's name. So I think the agent is a relatively new player. Now, you've negotiated with agents and lawyers and stuff before. What is Brendan having these long conversations with Kyle for? And then the next day having a conversation, a brief one. And that was deliberate too, saying it was brief. Brief means cold, right? So it was a new financial package and we had a brief brief conversation. That sure makes it sound like, here's my dollar amount, take it or fuck off. That's sh- that's, that's how Shanahan has has framed it. Yeah. That's how Shanahan paints the, the photo. But then, so you speak to Dubas about all these things. Then you have a brief conversation with the agent. And then the next day, Dubas sends you an email saying that he still wants the job. If that's how it happened, that's sloppy on Dubas's end. Your agent, if they have a role in this, if they're doing their job, shouldn't they be the one sending that email? My client is willing to blah, 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 blah. Yes, if, normally that's what If we- you're the one who brought the agent into this conversation, why are you the one sending that email? That's sloppy. And it's very strange from someone that's what would normally contracts all the time. Now, the whole point of an agent, if you've never had one before, is so that the management group you work for hates your agent and not you. Honestly, that's their job. Their job is to be ask Alan. Uh, His job is to negotiate on behalf of the players so the players can focus on hockey. And what focus on hockey means is they're not yelling and screaming on the phone and telling the general manager to fuck off when the offer is low. That's Alan's job. Or, or Don Meehan or uh, Pat Brisson or any of the people that, that do that job. Notably, has it, have you, do you know who Kyle Dubas' agent is? Isn't it a guy named Chris Armstrong? Yes. So he, and this has been going around, uh, his agent, Chris Armstrong, works at the agency Wasserman, which is a big agency, and one of their clients is... Austin Matthews. Austin Matthews. And that sucks a lot. That sucks a lot. And it's cause for concern. So th- those are some of the things that Dubas has done that uh, I didn't like in all this. But here's what I would say. Um, you know, he floats it out there that he might not want to be the GM, which I don't believe is what he said. It's just how Shanahan interpreted it. Um, It sounds like the agent rubbed Shanahan and or the board the wrong way. And it sounds like this all happened very quickly. Now, they are operating on a very tight deadline. But who created that deadline? Brendan. And the the board. And the board. What I would say is adults should have been able to come to a resolution here. Based on the information Shanahan has given us, I think they should have been able to work something out. Because all you told me in that statement is you think he's done a good job, you thought he was the guy for the job, and he slighted me, and so I fired him. And people are talking about, oh, he wasn't fired, his contract six just expiring. No, no, no. Six he, he, and a half a dozen guys. Like he was, he was he, yeah, he was summarily let go. Yeah, he, he's. If you're told to stop working six weeks before you're supposed to stop working, you were fired. However, they want to call it um, not renewed. However, you, know, you want to guys. We are it. not in court right now. We're just talking as human beings. He was fired. Um, like, does that is that not how you read it as well? that the board and or Brendan Shanahan reacted very emotionally to how that press conference went and how that, um, and how that sequence of events in the days that follow went. I want to hear what Jesse has to say. You guys outlined like the whole situation very well. And I feel like the missing piece of the whole situation is why was Kyle Dubas's job hanging it by a thread? 
Because the conclusions that we're drawing here is that it seems like a very rash decision. But the only reason you're making that rash decision is if you are not confident in Kyle Dubas and that his job it was hanging in the balance and that any moment it could have gone sideways. That contract that they put in front of him for the extension, it wasn't concrete. Like it sounds like Brendan Shanahan and the board were looking for every single excuse to not re-sign Kyle Dubas. They waited the year. Only Larry, Larry Tannenbaum wanted to do it. They waited until after the Florida series to offer the contract extension. Once they saw a little bit of shaky in that press conference, they pulled it right from him. That's the missing puzzle piece to me. It seems like we have a giant jigsaw that's missing this one piece. And that piece is what was the relationship with Brendan Shanahan and Kyle Dubas in so much that that contract that was in front of him could have been pulled at any moment you saw some resistance. Now, there's also another very deliberate bit that I forgot about. Brendan Shanahan referencing the fact that he also went through a full season without a contract for the next. Mm -hmm. Just because Brendan was a good little boy and worked that year without a contract uh, and went through the stresses of all that doesn't mean that everyone should have to go through that and everyone will handle it the same. And those dudes do not have different jobs. We went like a calendar year without seeing Brendan Shanahan's face and it didn't matter. You know what I mean? D Kyle Dubas uh, is much more front facing. The camera's on him during every game, watching him throw water bottles or sorry, recycle them expeditiously, you know, still making jokes uh, with the media and, and everything. I mean, the captain of this team is on this team because the Islanders were like, yeah, we're not going to sign him heading into this season. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can talk about, you know, John Tavares led them to believe this or led them to believe that you left yourself exposed. But they, they wanted to do that. Yes. Because they didn't want, in the end, they didn't want to bring back Kyle Dubas. They were okay with leaving him out there because there was a situation and it played out where they would be okay with losing him. Because so, of whatever, that I think that's, there's, there's this missing piece in that we don't want to go all the way and talk about, hey, the interpersonal relationship with Brendan Shannon and Kyle Dubas wasn't great because we don't know how it played out. But there's enough there's enough seeds there that we know that they didn't get along in some parts of, of their tenure together over this course of this nine years. Yeah. And when Kyle Dubas made the decision to try and we allegedly he tried to get a little bit more power with his new contract. He tried to get a little bit more money. He went rogue and did that press conference. Brendan Shanahan just put his foot down and said, no. Go ahead. No, no, I want you to go after you're done. After you're done, I'm going to no, support no, go ahead, point. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, I want to support Jesse's point. You mentioned, you mentioned that uh, why was Kyle Dubas' job hanging by a string? The reason that, and you mentioned the conversation that Chris Armstrong and uh, Brandon Shanahan, how we, Shanahan described it as brief, new compensation package. What's emerged since uh, is, and this is not totally surprising, this was suspected on Friday, that there was a power play. And this is a corporate power play. Um, this is one where Kyle Dubas came back and said, I need autonomy. I need autonomy to get the things done without running it up the chain through Brendan. And so essentially what happened here is the agent crafted a proposal last minute that not only said he's going to be the GM, but also some higher ranking position, probably president or something like that. He'd be GM and president. And therefore, it would allow for, based on the organizational structure of Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment in the Leafs division, it would allow for Kyle to go out and say, he, say he wants to call Doug Armstrong and make another trade for Ryan O'Reilly next year when Ryan O'Reilly signs in St. Louis. Um, he would be able to do that without permission. And it seems to me that the MLSE board, Larry, Bell, Rogers, and Brendan, thought that they were throwing Kyle Dubas a bit of a lifeline. Not that they weren't happy with the job, but they obviously weren't satisfied. And they thought, listen, we're going to give you a raise. 
We're going to give you some more years to get a crack at this. But like, you're on thinner ice. And Kyle's opinion is, I'm not on thinner ice. In fact, I've done a very good job. You told me I've done a good job. You told me I've done a good job. You're willing to extend me, but you need to up it. If you really want me to do this and really want me to take my process to the next level, then I can't be interfered with by the guy that's getting in the way, the the, the intermediary between the board uh, and the hockey team, which is Brendan Shanahan. Now, Brendan Shanahan... On Tuesday, I doubt very highly Brendan Shanahan made any sort of decision on Monday night in his drive home. I think what the nail in the coffin was here was Kyle Dubas' agent presenting them with a new compensation package because what happens if the board accepts that? If the board accepts Kyle Dubas' new management structure, and by the way, I'm not, I'm not guessing at this. This has been reported on. If, if, if the board accepts that, Brennan Shanahan essentially does not have a role outside of the business. And then the I, board... I saw a lot of people absolving him of any responsibility in this firing, and I thought that was such a bizarre way of thinking. No, this is, no. This is Kyle Dubas saying, I want Brendan on the business side, I want me on the hockey side. That's what I want. And the board would then look at Brendan Shanahan, eventually, and Brendan's not stupid. Mm-hmm. They would Hockey go Hall of Fame player, by the way. They would three time Stanley Cup winner, I think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I'm going to be cut out of hockey decision. Yeah. Okay. And 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 they're going to look at him and go, Brandon, why are we paying you so much when you just manage the business? We can get anybody to manage business. There's plenty of people with MBAs and doctorates in business. Mm hmm. And they and they aren't former hockey players. Maybe they're run, They're better at running a business. The reason we hired you is because of your NHL experience, your championship experience and your experience at NHL head office. You know, if you don't know this. Um, when the Leafs were looking for a president, Larry Tannenbaum called Gary Bettman and said, uh, who should I hire? And Gary Bettman said, Brandon Shanahan. That is how Shanahan is here today. And now Shanahan is going to Bettman for new candidates. Yes. And so I think to support Jesse's point, it was the new compensation package. People are making this about money. Of course, if you're going to be the president of the United or of the United States, president <laughs> of the Toronto Maple Leafs, yeah. you're going to want more money with that title. But typical of a major corporation, they'd love to give you the title, just no money. No, I'm kidding. Uh, they they would love to, but they would love to keep them in the organization. But Shanny is not going to let somebody take power away from him, and so Shanny's got to make a move there. Shanny's got to go. Hey, listen, if I take this to the board and they accept this, then I am I am basically signing my own resignation eventually. If Yo. so, so he has to. So he has to go. Well, I actually, you know, it's it's the fan, it's the conversation that he had with the press. That's the thing. That's the thing I don't want. Now, listen, you could be pro Dubis or anti Dubis. You could say he needs different voices in the room with him, whatever it is. But what happened here was a corporate play, and Dubis lost. He did, he did, and I think uh, like as as much as I don't like the way MLSE and Brandon Shanahan have handled this, Dubis wears some of this. Um, I also think that statement. Uh, before I continue, that statement was the wrong move. Kyle's statement? Yeah. Um, he needed to make one. Uh, and, th and this is what I was saying, because uh, people kept saying, well, you know, we only have Shanahan's side of the story. We only have Shanahan and therefore MLSE's side of the story. Well, the only reason that was the only side of the story we had is Dubas hadn't spoken yet. Mm -hmm. And then he did speak. And then it is his right to do so. And I know he didn't want to air air it all out there but he's he just said you know we're keeping it private and i was under the impression these discussions were private now maybe it's not in his best interest professionally to air out all of his dirty laundry the the way brendan shanahan did but now that shanahan gave his side of the story and it was airing dirty laundry and dubis released a statement and basically gave us nothing um, I'm forced to simply believe what Shanahan told us. I don't. I don't think you are. No, you're no, not. No, 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 no. Let me finish. Well, even you, uh, you're until people break news to the contrary. Like it's very convenient, and I think it hurts Brendan Shanahan's words that he said all of those things and aired all that dirty laundry without mentioning what Elliot Friedman reported with the power structure 
and Duke wow. is wanting to go to the board because the fact that you gave us all those details and you didn't give us the one that made you look like the bad guy sort of takes away everything you said, or it at very least it weakens it. Certainly changes the, the, the potency of the story. It changes how I view it, but how many people are going to hear that report versus how many people have seen that press? Yeah, report? that's the thing. You're you're asking him to be transparent so that his his hand is all out there, but he's playing the same corporate game that Kyle Dubas is playing. Like mm-hmm. he, pl- he played that press conference to paint this picture a very direct way, and you're asking him to be honest. You're like Brendan, yeah. stop, be I'm honest not with us. Asking him to be honest, I'm just that's why people seem to be taking sides here, and mm-hmm. this is why I'm saying there's blame to go around. What if there's no side to take? Because here's what I want to say. Both sides, and I agree with CJ completely on this, both sides will regret this. Where is yes. Where is Kyle Dubas, and I, this is no disrespect to the Penguins, or, or the, I know the Flames are announcing their GM today, wherever he ends up next, and he'll get a job, and he'll be president and, 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 and general manager, no question. Where else is he going to have the financial resources? the nine years to build this team deliberately, slowly, finding great people, bringing them into the fold, making sure your different teams work together. Where's Dubas gonna get that? It's He's gonna go to a market and he's gonna have the issues that every new general manager has, which is you need to make a move and you need to make this team better immediately. When he came to Toronto, the expectation is that the Leafs were gonna be ass, and ass for like three years. And in fact, they ended up being better sooner than we thought. Uh, and, and, and so, so those expectations are going to be completely different. You go to Pittsburgh, you got to win fucking now mm-hmm. and whatever they're missing, you better, you better skin graft that onto the team right now because the core is there. He, he's dealing with a core three in Pittsburgh if he goes. And, and I, the other thing is, is so, so we got that where's Kyle Dubas going to have that kind of lead up time, that sort of highway, that lift off to to really be confident in all the team members that he has and get to know everybody and, and that sort of thing. Then you got Maple Leaf Sports, which has built this program, and it's been quite successful with the exception of the playoffs. All the way down, ECHL team's been good. AHL team's been good. Championship. They have developed players, despite, I don't know why people are saying they haven't developed players. They've for sure developed players. Yes, they have. Been a bit of a lull. And then you have a hockey player, you know, one of their first round picks is cancer. And and so, they're, but they're, they've got players in the system that are coming in. Mm-hmm. Matthew Nice was one of them. Yeah. He's well, well drafted. And, and I mean, no one's going to want to hear this, but a lot of the players they've uh, drafted and or developed, they've traded. Uh, and, but they... They got value value back. Trevor Moore was a key piece in a key trade. And that dude was a college free agent who played like a fourth line role in the minors. Leaves call him up. He's actually competent. So competent that the LA Kings want him. And yes, he's turned into a key piece for the Kings, but no, there was no guarantees on that. Yeah, there was no guarantees on that. And also uh, the Leafs needed a goalie extremely badly and they got one who they used for two years. So so then where is Maple Leaf Sports going to find a general manager to be able to step in, make the kind of moves they have to make? And let's go through that list very quickly. Uh, Resign Austin Matthews. Uh, make a decision on what you're going to do in terms of what this team is going to look like. Um, Nylander into the, up, into Neil, the Nylander as well. And and here's the thing. Now you're further hampered by what CJ broke yesterday on the CJ show. Brendan Shanahan. Oh, can we play that? Yeah. Do you want to you want to play it, uh, Jess? Mm-hmm. This is really important because it's it's hamstrung. Any moves the new general manager would hope to make with a team. He's, by the way, stepping into a job with a bunch of people who are pro Dubas. Everybody that's worked there, Dubas put there. Mm-hmm. Which Shanahan gave him autonomy to do. Yes. And he let him go because of a, a, f- a few bad days. So this is where I wonder about, and, and Jesse's just pulling the clip here. I wonder about how this benefits either side. And I've spent my weekend wondering if, if it's not a good idea that maybe this later this week they pick up the phone call and go, maybe we really fucked this up. But let's play this. What's interesting to me is that Brendan Shanahan phoned each of the Leafs' top players last week to share the news about Kyle Dubas and that those players came away from those conversations 
believing that Shell, that that Brendan Shanahan's intention is to bring the entire core four back. Now that's not written in stone, and obviously we don't know the GM is maybe the new GM has a new has a different perspective on that. But I do think it's interesting that as much as we focused on the possibility for change, maybe even the need for change, that those players actually believe that that they're going to be back together at least at this point in time. I was a, a little surprised by that. I mean, it, just just because. There had been so much talk, and obviously even Kyle Dubas had opened the door on his last Monday press conference saying that everything would be on the table if he was running the team. Uh, well, well, Brendan Shanahan's the top voice in the hockey department, and you know I don't know if he gave assurances or promises. You know We might get into semantics here, but certainly those players I don't think are bracing to be traded now. Even, even as much speculation is out there, it just seems that they believe the organization wants to move forward with them as, as a core four, so that, that'll be something to watch. So, so now you're bringing in this, a general manager, just to recap, you're bringing in a general manager who's got to figure out Dubis's people and figure out who, who of them are on side and willing to work with them too. Because remember, that all plays a part of this too. Are they, are they, are they loyal to the Leafs? Or are they loyal to Dubis? And you have like half a cap to work with. And now, yeah. And now you can't really trade the big guys because you know, Shani's not going to approve it. Dubis was finally willing to to move on from at least one of these guys, maybe two. And the day he said that was the day you were like, you know what? Maybe he's not the GM for us. So now like we're, as we gather evidence, as we hear more reports from Fridge, from CJ, the less I just believe what Shanahan said, uh, well, like, you knew it was always going to be one sided, right? You know, if you're going to hear from one side of the equation, it's one sided. Yeah, but there's there's like Dubas was willing to move on from guys. Shanahan's not willing to do that. So if the decision's already made for the new guy, I'm wondering what incentive there is for the new guy to come on board. What are they even going to do? That's a lot of money. Uh, I'm sure it's a lot of money. But what what are they even going to do uh, if the decision is made for them? And this is why it's such a short-sighted position, and this is why I thought there could have been some sort of rev- resolution here. So, you know, Dubas and his agent bring you the package. At some point, I would have hoped for like a line in the sand conversation where you at least say, here's our line, and we are not willing to go over it. And Dubas can do the same, and if Dubas walks, fine. If you draw your line in the sand and you walk, fine. It doesn't sound like that conversation happened. It just sounded like, you know what? I'm done with this. And he was let go. And it's extremely short-sighted because it's now left them in a situation where like Brad Treliving is the top candidate, it sounds like. The Calgary Flames won't let him work the draft. By the way, uh, Sports Interaction, Brad Living is the number one at 220 to one. Yeah, to, to me, uh, a GM who is not able to work the next five, six weeks for the Toronto Maple Leafs is a non-option. That's a non-option. You can't hire that person uh, because <laughs> what are you talking about? We have the draft. We have a number of players to re-sign and potentially trade. Marner's no move kicks in. July 1st. Although he's not getting traded. The decision was made for you. Uh, Matthew's no trade kicks in. Although, you know, he's not getting traded. The decision was made for you. Nylander's no trade kicks in. Although he's not getting traded. The decision was made for you. I'm just wondering what the job of the next GM even is if they can't work over the next month and a half and all the decisions have already been made. Well, and maybe you're seeing why Kyle Dubas submitted that last minute change. No shit. It sounds like Kyle Dubas would be, he'd be fine with the outcome of this situation if sticking around was contingent on having autonomy and be in being moved above or at least on par with Brendan Shanahan and making the decisions for the organization. Because if he wanted that autonomy and he didn't get it, then he's perfectly fine with leaving the organization. Yeah. The- so the the hey, I wish Kyle Dubas stuck around is like Kyle Dubas didn't want to stick around because he wouldn't have had the yeah. decision making that he wanted. So there was no place for him here. Which which brings me to and on and just on Brendan's side, if he wouldn't give up that decision making. So there was kind of no resolution here. If that was the only thing on the table, both guys should say no to that. I think there was a level of immaturity to both sides. 
But uh, uh, where's the resolution if both guys want that autonomy? You have there to give a, both guys would have to give a little. You know, the great and, the best and negotiations. They willing to agreed, agreed, and and the best negotiations are ones where bo- that, both sides both sides walk away feeling a little bit like fuck. I left something on the table. I mean, but we came to a resolution. I think. You know, the best negotiations, best compromises are you're not fully happy, but you got some of what you wanted. Shanahan could have given a little. Yeah. Dubas could have given a little. Dubas asked for some things and the Leafs could have told him no. Yeah. The but way they and they, they could have no come back. Him was yeah. Like fire. Brendan, you're dealing with a person in Brendan Shanahan who's not willing to lose the negotiation at all. Not willing to give anything up. So it's it's that. I do wish they negotiated the, with their players like that. Yeah, that's the start and end Isn't with that with ironic? Shanahan. This is how it all ended with a so, with with an agent, which is a little too cute. I think that's unfortunate. Because I agree. I think you should be able to give and get in those situations. And if the power was the whole thing, it's a start and stop with Brendan Shanahan. And I don't agree with that at all. But that's his thinking in this situa- situation. I, so there's there's sides being taken here. Brendan was in the right. Kyle was in the right or Kyle was in the wrong. Brendan was in the wrong. And I think that clouds the bigger conversation of the Toronto Maple Leafs, the health, the state of the Toronto Maple Leafs is far less healthy than it was last week. They're in a really, really bad situation. They are. Yeah. And And they might come out of it fine. But signs are not pointing that way. And there's, I don't think there's real sides to pick. Like the picking sides is kind of, it's like a fun game, but you, we don't know everything that went on. So you can't really pick the sides. And also these are two guys who are playing corporate politics. That's what's happening. And there's no good or bad and there's no right side or wrong side. It's an unfortunate ending. And this is what, how it played out. Agreed. And I, I think I think you're you're nailing it, Jesse. And I think the problem here is that neither side benefits from it. No, nobody is better <laughs> off today for it. So if you have two reasonable sides working towards a conclusion, you will get there. You will get there. But we didn't have that here. And 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 I think and I'm sorry to cut you off there. And I think this is where, you know, we're we're really going to see this is why Shanahan is now the head of things. This is why he's the face of things. So when you are angry about the next GM's moves, don't be. You know who the GM really is. But it started and with the Shanna plan. I know. When did he stop becoming the face of things? Well, because he allowed for Dubas to take more of the, the good and the bad. His guy. His guy who he brought in. And I go back to what I said before this whole process started. How does Brendan Shanahan have this bullet? He shouldn't have this bullet. This is this is your guy. This is your guy. Everything about it. And maybe maybe the reason he gets to spend the bullet is they're satisfied with the job he did. So I ask again, why isn't he the GM of the Leafs today? Well, I I wondered, guys, over the weekend, and this is going to sound far-fetched and probably isn't going to happen, but I think it's worth bringing up. To me, it's going to make sense someday in retrospect. These guys this week should phone each other. They should <laughs> they should stop what they're doing and they should work this out. And that's not really a proposal that's been tabled, but there is no way that either side is better off without each other. So somebody drop your ego, pick up the phone and make it work. You think he comes back? I don't think either side comes back, no, but is that is the better resolution here. All right. You see, you said like that's. Dubis is Shanahan's guy, but maybe Dubis grew into somebody Somebody who's not his guy. Because he's not subservient. Because that's that's what it that's what it sounds like. It sounds like Dubis is no longer doing the Shanna plan and he wanted even more power in the situation. And I don't think so. The whole thing that Shanahan outlined is like, we're very happy with Dubis and like everything that went on. Like, I don't believe a lot of those words. I don't believe that you were so over the moon about Dubis's performance over the last nine years and since last offseason, he's made every great move. I don't believe that. I believe you di- disagreed with a lot of his decision making. He's no longer your guy. So you got to get rid of him and bring in somebody who's your guy again. And the, the you know, it's funny. They brought in a young guy. And I think the perception is young guys, you know, you can push around and boss mm-hmm. around a little bit. And then he grew into someone you can't boss around. Mm-hmm. Now they want a GM with experience. 
and quote bite and yeah bite no so by the way that i saw that graphic going around i don't think friedman ever used the word bite uh, he did he did he did, he did? On yeah the air. yeah he said he's that, looking he didn't say it i'd he have said, to listen to it again he said for his sources it. told him that they're looking for someone with bite yeah it was hockey night in canada intermission second intermission the 32 thought segment he said bite so <laughs> i i just ignore that word uh <laughs> it was, it was it. very funny they, they want an experienced gm Right, yeah. that's what everyone has said. And to bite you, and ex- yeah, and the iron, big old it'll, chomp, it'll get you. They, I, I think, you know, a GM with bite could, or a GM with experience <laughs> could be the sort of GM who is willing to get into fuck you matches with the president um, and ownership, um, and maybe that's the sort of guy they need. I highly doubt Brandon Shanahan right now. Is going. I want to hire someone who's going to tell me to fuck myself. I think he had that in Kyle Dubas. I think he had that in Kyle Dubas. So sometimes, and I'm not trying to insult anyone specifically, um, but I think sometimes these GMs who get recycled and passed around the entire league, these experienced GMs have a track record of what success. Well, no, a lot of the candidates who are up for this job do not have a track record of success. So what do they have a track record of? I think it's a track record of obedience. There was somebody in Minnesota who you really loved, who was general manager, who just- How the fuck is his name? Who just did what the the owner said. And then I believe he was in Philadelphia and he just kind of did what the owner said all the time. I I had someone reach out to me that someone on the board, um, someone on the board- actually brought up chuck fletcher's name and that to me indicates someone on the board doesn't watch fucking hockey well are you surprised by that ridiculous the people that run the game don't watch the game no they're they're too busy they're billionaires they have other things to do if you're listening to this shut the fuck up forever never have an opinion on any hockey thing ever again go to the side and shut the find another job get coffee for the rest of the board you think chuck fletcher is the best guy for this job holy shit are you Jim Benning? Like, if you look at the some of the names who are available, it's a lot of guys who, before they became available, read fired. Um, we looked at their job the, that they did, and we're like, are they able to do their job? Or are they just the yes man for ownership who ownership pushes around? Chuck Fletcher. Mm-hmm. Uh uh, Jim, Benning. Jim Benning. Jim Benning. I almost said. Let me. Let me. Let me get the uh, odds for you here. Uh, and uh, and uh, Br- I mean Brad Treliving left had because he didn't. Rep- he had that reputation. He yeah. had that reputation. I don't think Calgary let him do a damn thing that he wanted to do. Wait, which is why also, he left though. He's he has no winning track record at all. No, he's, he's, he's never best, made it first out and of, out team. He's never made it out of the second round in his career. I mean, and really, the only time they made it to the second round with that Flames roster that was outrageously talented and so disappointing was against was last year against Edmonton. Mm-hmm. Like, like they were a fir- one and done team, one and done team, one and done team. If they made the playoffs, so ignoring because some of these guys have a track record of success as AGM and eh, doesn't count. General manager, can you read some of the names? Well, so True Living's at a two twenty. Never made it. A- Brandon Pridham's an AGM, but you're saying no. Uh, no, I'd, uh, well, it's an internal hire. It's different when it's Sh- see Shani Shani to me. I think people are getting thrown off by what he said. He said he's looking for, he said an ideal candidate would have some general management experience, right? That's what he said. I'm paraphrasing that to me doesn't mean that you were a general manager. It means that you have worked as GM with your name, be that assistant or or regular. You've been on a trade call. You've made a, a, a proposition. We need to get this guy. You've done a negotiation, which why, which is why I think everybody's going. Well, the list of current like uh, GMs that are that are unemployed that would be good for this position is rather small. Yes, do you really think the Leafs are going to go? No, uh, we're not going to look at anybody with an A next to their GM. But we have heard on. the names like Matthew Darsh in the conversation. We have, you know, not we, in the we, Leaf one. And if if you're looking at the cast of AGMs. People like that should be the guys you're interviewing. And it's weird that we don't have the reports and the most reported names are these old guard general managers yeah. who are Bergevin, who, who are, by the way, is a 21 to one. a big name. Why found. is his name coming up? Mark Hunter is nine to one on sports interaction. Mark Hunter. And I said this and a lot of the grumpies came out. He doesn't have professional hockey 
experience. Oh, he was a player. Fucking when? Who are you talking about? Mark Hunter. In oh, Mark Hunter. Oh, yeah. 80s Mark and 90s. Hunter. Here, let, let, let me look it up. Oh. I want to see the last year, because I know Mark Hunter was the head coach for one year of the St. John's Maple Leafs, and that, I believe, was in the early 2000s. Mark Hunter, like, I, the balls for anyone to fucking say this to me. Hunter played seven games in the 92-93 season for the Washington Capitals. That was his last year um, in the NHL, and he played 28 games with the Baltimore Slapjacks of the AHL. That was his last professional hockey playing experience. He has one year as a professional hockey coach. The St. John's Maple Leafs lost in the second round in 96-97. Other than that, he has two years as the director of player personnel with the Leafs, uh -huh. followed by two years as the AGM. He's 60 years old, and it's fine that he's 60 years old, but generally speaking, if you're going to hire an inexperienced guy, you don't go with the older one. This dude does not have professional hockey experience. Yeah, look, look at the, uh, the championships he's won with London. I wish I could properly express. Express. My tongue doesn't work. Mm. How little that fucking matters. It's it's the OHL. It's not the fucking same. And then people go, yeah, well, what about Dubas? Dubas was hired to be the assistant GM under Lou Lamorello. They developed the guy. So he wasn't just thrown to the wolves. They, dre they got a hot prospect guy, brought him in developed him and they liked him so much that he was with the organization for nine years, four of which I think he was the GM. Mark Hunter could have stayed on board by the way, but Dubas got the job and he said, I don't want this. I'm going to go back to my comfortable spot in London. I don't He's, think his name is high up on the list. Steve. It's not high up on the list. And but it's I being wish put out there and Bergevin. Come on guys. And Stan Bowman. Come on guys. Stan Bowman. I'm just completely disinterested in. It's just not. It's just and not Stan even going to happen. Stan Bowman shouldn't be let back in the NHL. Like for, forget being the GM of one of the biggest franchises on planet Earth. Yeah. Are we doing Quenville? Do I have a moment? Yeah. That? Take it. Um. I am completely not on board with uh, Joel Quenville potentially being uh, the head coach of the Leafs. Um. Or even being reinstated. Um, I know we posted odds yesterday that he, you know, he was the odds on favored to be the new coach. Listen, is he the best hockey coach available? Yeah, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, am I desperate for my team to win? Yep. Do I want him to be the head coach of my team? Absolutely not. Under no circumstances do I want him to be the coach of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Cause at the end of the day, this is about fandom and cheering your team on and I can't cheer my team on if Joel Quenville is the head coach. Um, this is the anniversary of the Chicago Blackhawks winning uh, the Western Conference Final over the San Jose Sharks, which I believe is the day all the Blackhawks brain trust, including Joel Quenville, were told about the accusations made against Brad Aldrich by Kyle Beach. I don't know if Kyle Beach was named um, in that conversation. Stan Bowman was part of that conversation. And Joel Quenville got upset that that those allegations could disrupt the team and prevent them from winning a championship. Do I think Joel Quenville is the only coach who would react that way and say those things? Absolutely not. Not a chance. But he's the one who did. But he's the one who did. Do I think Joel Quenville regrets behaving that way and acting that way and reacting that way? Yeah, I do. I do think he genuinely regrets that. However, the next wrinkle that I think a lot of people forget about because we're so obsessed with that singular moment is he also, after learning of these allegations, gave Brad Aldrich a glowing written uh, endorsement endorsement for his next job mm -hmm. for his next job. Uh, well, and jobs going forward. Cause I doubt he threw the letter away. Um, when it's Joel Quenville, uh, Stanley cup winning, definitely going to the hockey hall of fame coach. Joel Quenville gives you a letter of endorsement and Brad Aldrich used his Stanley cup pedigree with the Chicago Blackhawks and endorsements like that to go work at a high school and rape a minor that happened. 
Do I think Joel Quenville... Do I think people make mistakes? Absolutely. Do I think Joel Quenville regrets that deeply and sincerely? I hope so. And I bet he does. Do I want him on my team? No. I I, I think people deserve second chances. And I, I, I think, you know, th- there was the idea of it being presented as baggage uh, by some in the media. Uh, and like, I mean, Sheldon Keefe had some baggage too. Right. Mm-hmm. Like he, he, he had a checkered past. Um, I can't get past this. And, you know, should he be reinstated into the NHL? It's, it's not, it's not even your call. It's not my call, but as a Leafs fan, do I want this guy to be the head coach of my hockey team? Absolutely. The fuck not. I don't like the precedent that would be going on if he was reinstated for like fairly soon, like this summer or something like that, because it was, October of 2021 that he didn't he wasn't fired he wasn't uh like taken out of his position because of what happened Joel Quenville was allowed to resign after coaching his final game they let him coach that game knowing everything was happening and he got his final game and then he resigned and that was in October of 2021 and it hasn't been two years yet and if the punishment for going through everything you just outlined is hey you get to resign on your own terms and then just sit out two years and then you're back that is an awful precedent to set within this league and this organization. How could anybody respect the institution if this is what your punishment is? You get to go away on your own terms and just chill out for two years and then you're just back. What And, and like, what are you doing? Like, I'm sure you're doing some thinking and repenting, but really it's also just about the public forgetting. Yeah, right? you, you took time off so the media narrative would kind of go away and then you could just rejoin your group of guys in hockey. And, and I think it's important that I read this specific quote because I talked about the endorsement. So this is, and this has been going around recently. This is from Frank Saravalli uh, from the report. And I believe he's talking about the Jenner and Block report. Joel Quenville wrote an evaluation of Brad Aldrich on June 29th uh, 2010. Like this is mere weeks after receiving these allegations, uh, after Aldrich had already resigned from the organization in a June, 2009 unsigned performance evaluation. Quenville wrote that Brad did a great job to accommodate the coaches preparing for meetings and their everyday needs. I believe going forward, Brad can be more efficient by being in a separate working environment and not in the middle, uh, constantly being disturbed. Uh, In his last performance evaluation, dated June 29th, 2010, after Aldrich had separated from the team, but uh, unsigned by Quenville and Aldrich, uh, Quenville wrote, Aldrich did a great job for the coaching staff in preparing us for all of our meetings and coordinating several tasks that we uh, forward his way. Brad has several people relying on him at the same moment and has a way of deflecting and accommodating everyone at once. Congrats on winning the Stanley cup exclamation mark. When interviewed Quenville stated that he did not recall whether he wrote the June 29th, 2010 evaluation of Aldrich, or if he knew whether Aldrich uh, had been separated at the time but did not dispute that he may have written the evaluation. He further stated that the review looked to him like something he would write. Additional performance evaluations of coaches dated June 29th, 2010, also unsigned by Quenville, were similarly written and contain the same language congratulating the employee on the Stanley Cup win. I think think a team as image conscious as the Toronto Maple Leafs are um first off they haven't made any phone calls until today like that didn't start also, till today they have a head coach they do have a head coach yes. so everybody that's worried Isn't about that it kind of important to mention like yeah but you know what it's an understandable yeah. question about like you know the new gm wants to bring in their coach totally understand we all that. know how this works but but i i, I do want to say that that uh um the fact is the toronto maple leafs are an image conscious organization. There are a lot of organizations in the sport that are not. Remember, uh, who was the LA Kings defenseman that was banned from the league? Slava Voinov. Yeah. There were teams that wanted him. I could tell you that the Toronto Maple Leafs were not one of them. Specifically, not because they didn't need right side defense help, because they fucking did, but because they know that their fans would have an issue with it. And everybody saw what happened with, with Boston and Mitchell Miller, right? Everybody saw that. If you think the response would be 
less than that with Leafs Nation and the hiring of either of those two guys, you're out of your mind. They know. The Leafs know. Listen, they, they maybe made a stupid decision with Dubas or maybe they may ended up making a smart one. But they're well aware of how the public uh, and how the people in this town feel about that sort of thing. And I, 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 would, I would be absolutely gobsmacked if they even made the phone call. Yeah. I don't think the Leafs are interested in that. And, and I, I think that they already know, and, and CJ said it in their article, they have knowingly now plunged themselves into chaos. And so now with the chaos, they're going to have to what? What do you do with chaos? You try to bring it back down into order, right? And creating more chaos would be doing that. The safe choice is probably what they're going to go with. Safer and younger. They're going to go with somebody who's got experience. And I think they want a bit of a track record with a team that's won things. Not necessarily Stanley Cups. But I don't believe for a second that they're just going to revert back. I think that's a lot of media speculation. I think that's uh, website speculation. I have not heard a single thing that leads me to believe personally that they've made a phone call to Gary Bettman about either of those two people. And I know that Gary and Stan are supposed to meet after the playoffs. And, and Stan Bowman interviewed for the Calgary job. Right. Before Conrad got it. Which means the Flames interviewed Stan Bowman. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's what that means. No, no. So, no, no. Like, what is that? I, like what, what, the reason I'm posing it that way yeah. is, I mean, of course Stan Bowman wants that job. Of yeah. course he does. But it's wild the Flames would consider him. Yeah, he was on the list and they talked to him about it. And It's not that wild when you consider how the Flames operate. No, but I on the also, business side, it's not that wild. It's Stan, not surprising. Stan Bowman, and there's a reason I've talked about Quenville more than Bowman. Um, I want to read more about uh, what happened to remind myself of Stan Bowman's role in all this. Because what I remember is the Blackhawks spoke so glowingly of Stan Bowman on his way out that at the end of it, I was almost like, "How are? Why are they even firing him? Hmm. Like, if if oh, he helped so much with this and so much with that, and we bless him for his role and all our cups and what he's done for this organization." By the end of it, I was like, "Jesus, just keep the guy." What was the name of the president? John McDonough. John McDonough. It, we we know for a fact they hated each other. Well, and John McDonough is the one who carries. If there was a in, in those three or four guys that were in on those conversations, John McDonough is unquestionably the person that carries the most blame because he was the one that told them, no, nope, don't go to the cops. We'll keep it internal. I'll handle it. That's what he did. And so, um, you know, I think it's important that, that that people do know that John McDonough, who is no longer in the game, who's too old. He's I think he's retired. Um, that's the guy that. First off, they, everybody hated him. Everybody was fearful of him mm -hmm. at the, in the organization. And he's the guy that that ultimately made those decisions. I'm not letting either of the other people off the hook, but I do I do think it's important that we understand that structure. Yeah. And I think there are teams that just plainly don't give a shit about their public perce perception. And I appreciate the fact that you re under you know that you've you've brought the Quinville stuff back to light. Hundred percent get that. I don't think that was ever a consideration for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Not a fucking chance. Their brand is already, even if you keep Dubas, this, this, there's a huge question mark next to the Toronto Maple Leaf brand right now. Because yeah. frankly, what are you going to do to get through? I don't care that you're in the toughest division. I don't care that you outplayed the Panthers. Look at Boston, you and the Carolina Hurricanes by metrics. All the metrics have outplayed the Florida Panthers and should have won their series. They should be called the Florida fuck metrics. And, and, and look at that. The Florida Panthers are up 3-0. And by the way, we will get to that series. I'm, I apologize to all the fans of those teams. Um, well, this is our first show after a long weekend where Leafs Twitter was apoplectic. Yeah. And <laughs> I, 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 I two hours. So, you know, we, we sort of did talk about this, but I, I think in, there's Jonas Siegel pointed out in his article to me. This is what Shanny's quote was on the general manager situation. There's an urgency to do that. I don't think it needs to be rushed. I want to really say I'm not going to be hasty. Uh, I want to be very thoughtful and thorough, but I do think it's a priority and it needs to happen rather soon. And I think this sort of backs up what Steve said about Brad Tree Living. I'm really surprised that a guy like Brad Tree Living would be involved in, in these sorts of discussions. Not because he's not good, but I, I didn't see a whole heck of a lot of huge success like he, he's he's drafted some good prospects um he did make some good trades i do think everybody's like oh that huberto contract sucks maybe it does but i do think 
Uh, there's a reason he fell from 120 to 65 points. And I think that the Flames are going to be much different. Because next of the year. coach that he wasn't allowed to fire. That's right. Like it. But I don't think uh, nothing to me says Brad Treliving should be an NHL general manager for the Toronto Maple Leafs. That's a promotion. And I don't see how I don't see how in oh, uh, the core. That's no. how you're supposed to look at it. Well, and but also the core of the Leafs is objectively better than the current core of the Flames. Just skill for skill. So don't tell me that he he would deserve a step up. This is why a lot of people is like, wait a second here. Let's all calm down. Shanahan's not even made the first fucking phone call yet. And 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 Chris said this perfectly on on the CJ show yesterday. He he was saying, listen, that might be the odds on favorite right now. But you never know after that first round of phone calls how things go. Maybe they say something in the meeting that that pisses Brendan off. Maybe one of them goes, you have to trade one of the core four. And Brendan goes, fuck that. We're not going to do that. Well, that would take that person out of the lineup, right? Mm -hmm. So I think I think everybody bring it down on the on the uh, speculation part because we don't even know who they're phoning. We don't even know who's on the list. We don't know who they're talking to. By the way, the Leafs should never do a favor for another team ever again. Absolutely not. The the uh, no. the. Because, okay, so to my understanding, Tampa's jerseys used to be, a, it was black, silver, blue, and white, mm -hmm. right? Some combination of that. The Lightning had to get permission from the Leafs to be blue and white. That's my understanding. Yes. And the Leafs went, yeah, sure. Which is so stupid. The 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 Leafs getting dinged for the practice facility stuff. The the Leafs getting dinged for flying their own prospects o overseas. And now Brad Treliving being held hostage by the Calgary Flames. If a team, if any one of the 31 other teams call up the Toronto Maple Leafs asking for anything, you fart into the phone and hang it up. Even the waiver wire pickups. Yeah. Oh, Exactly. Exact. I would love the Leafs to leave a little bit of fuck with you room, like uh, just leave a couple roster spots and some fuck with you room to mm -hmm. claim guys off waivers. Well, then you got the right guy in charge based on how this week went. If you want to fuck with you, then Brendan Shanahan, Brendan Shanahan. You should you should be confident in the Shanahan plan. Well, I, I'm not because like because Adam, you talked about two reasonable people come to a reasonable decision in in negotiations. Well, one side is unreasonable that we know of. I don't know about Kyle Dubas because he hasn't talked, but we know one side is acting unreasonable. So you got the right person in charge, Steve. You should be very happy. Maybe who knows? Maybe he's the right guy for this league. Maybe Dubas was a little too polite and too cordial mm -hmm. and too willing to help people. Maybe it's a ruthless league full of frothing assholes. And they need one of those. I just don't get the impression Bradshaw Living's that. But the man who is going to be dictating what Bradshaw Living can do can be that, mm -hmm. as 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 evidenced by this week. Maybe so. maybe he's the perfect match in that Brendan Shanahan will still be in charge, mm -hmm. but Brad will be like, ah, you know what? It's still better. <laughs> you know what? I still have more power than I had in Calgary. Did your confidence in the future of the Maple Leafs? drop because of what happened this week. Yes. Significantly. Significantly. Can I read something that summed up how I felt from Down Goes Brown? Sure. Sure. Who, by the way, another person who's just on an absolute fucking heater. Again, he's he's the Holy orchestra shit. playing as the Titanic sinks. Just one last reminder of there's still beauty in the world. <laughs> the the title of the article is for the first time in a decade, it feels like the old Leafs. And he said, under Brandon Shanahan, that feeling of the old Leafs went away until today. Leafs fans know the feeling I mean. It's the sense that this team doesn't know what it's doing. That they're a never-ending source of drama and not the good kind. That they're a sideshow. That nobody in charge has a firm hand on the wheel or any real plan. The Maple Leafs wanted to take a season to decide on their path forward. After almost a year, sorry, after most of a year, they made their decision. And then they changed their minds in four days based largely on one press conference. I'm looking for a way that this story reflects well on this team. I'm not finding it. Instead, this feels the way the old Leafs would do things, rashly. Brandon Shanahan, by the way, uh, was around for the old Leafs. Well, he was arguably the transition away from it. And I have to give him credit for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Huge credit Absolutely. for that. Yeah, and I, I think the era that Downs, Down Goes Brown is talking about is like the post-lockout post era from... 04 through 2012 when they did not make the what playoffs any of those years piece of shit yeah now, it, those were the real awful years yeah so apparently like on, not even rebuilding mm -mm. like to, oh. just doing nothing 
Oh, we're second last. <laughs> oh, we gave away our first pick. Fuck. Um, thir- Fridge on 32 Thoughts uh, said uh, one of the names uh, that is making the rounds a lot right now is Mark Hunter. That doesn't mean he's a candidate. It means his agent or his PR person yes. is dropping his name. Yes. By the way. Non-option. So you know how it works. Non-option. And he said, I think you're going to hear the name Mark Bergevin. Mm-hmm. I mean, Bergevin has <clears throat> at least a professional he's been to a cup, hockey resume. He went to a cup final. Uh, here's the thing with Bergevin. He win, He absolutely fucking blows half of his trades. Uh, but then the other half were pretty good. And and uh, I would do, do not want Mark Bergevin running this. Bergevin game. on paper is a very good candidate to take over the Toronto Maple Leafs. So, oh, except for the fact that he sucks. Well, so here before you get into that, worth mentioning because a few people were alarmed at the fact that his name isn't lumped in with the other group. There, there were two active people in NHL front offices who were supposedly. Oh yeah. Well, they were in the Blackhawks organization uh, when what we just talked about with Kyle Beach happened. Shevel Dayoff of the Jets was actually in the room mm-hmm. and was absolved because apparently he had no power. I'm wondering why he got a Stanley Cup ring. Um, and then there's Mark Bergevin, who was the director of player personnel, I believe was his title. And we're to believe he just didn't know anything about it, which I said at the time, and I will reiterate, I have a, an extraordinarily difficult time believing. So that some people have the ick from him because of that. Mm-hmm. Other people have the ick because they just don't like some of the moves he did. The coaches he hired. The, the way he, he handled players. I hated the Subban trade. It ended up working out pretty well for them. Didn't look like that at first. Mm-hmm. You know, but I didn't like the coaches that he hired, how he treated players. Remember was uh was uh, what's his name? The uh, um, uh, he ended up coaching the pens as well. Tyrion. And like, I think P.A. Parenteau, the story is that he showed up to camp after having a really good year with Montreal, Terrian's new coach, and he goes, I don't like the way you play hockey. Well, I want to change everything about your game. Cool. And Terrian was, and Habs fans, you know this, one of the worst coaches except for Ducharme has got to be the worst coach the Habs have ever had. <laughs> got to be the worst. But, but Terrian really was don't not. don't like that guy. His de- no, because he's, and guess who made both hires? Mark, this is why I don't like him. Well, he he I want to say like, what is it? 18 months ago or so. He resigned from the Habs. Uh, He left them in a great spot, by the way. They're doing great. Uh, They Actually, thank God for the guys that they did bring in because they're making great moves now. And uh, but he was there from 2012. And it's it's funny, though, because we've had this conversation before about, well, you judge a GM based on how he left the team. He left them a smoldering friggin ruin. And like, yeah, they did have some pieces to build off of, but like, who's their goalie, <laughs> for example? Um, not every young prospect you think is going to hit is going to hit. I'm personally of the belief that the Habs are going to be pretty good in short order. Um, so maybe that will reflect well on him. But remember, it took two years of being unwatchable. <laughs> well, I also want to throw this at you. He left them with two boat anchor contracts that would have stunted their development had it not been for career-ending injuries. Hmm. Shea Weber's contract and Carey Price's contract. What? What were? Where would the Habs be today? Shea I look Weber's- at. I look at what Sergei Bobrovsky is doing right now, and I don't believe the Carey Price thing. If Carey Price was healthy, he could be doing the exact same thing. Okay. Okay. Well, he did it. He did it three years ago. Right. right. He did it. Okay. Jay Weber, on the other hand, I think, yeah. So oh. the other guys that names name came up, and this is from the CJ show, is Doug Armstrong, and I'm not sure, and CJ wasn't either, why Doug Armstrong's name is being put in here because um, he, first off, former guest on Agent Provocateur, I'm going to throw that out there, great interview, he great was awesome. Uh, he's perfect around the press. If you talk to St. Louis fans, Doug Armstrong says a whole boatload of nothing, which is why they were so surprised when he was on AP and he just talked for an hour, um, but. Doug Armstrong has the experience. He has a recent cup. I think that matters. 2019. Uh, and he's doing a real quick turnaround on those St. Louis Blues. Man, they're going to be a power again in like a year. or It might even be next season. I'm a fan of what they're doing. Um, but he's the St. Louis Blues general manager. And why would St. Louis... <laughs> Three give, years. Why would St. Louis give him permission to speak to the Leafs? It made no sense. Now... Where did, I don't understand where it came from and why people thought that it was could happen if he has three years left on his deal. I wonder if where there's smoke, there's fire, though, because Brian Burke was the rumored 
Like this is the next GM of the Toronto Maple Leafs. And do you remember the big problem with that? He was GM of the Calgary Flames? No, he was GM of the Anaheim Ducks. Oh, Anaheim Ducks, my bad. And he, th- this is, a, a, I'll take a sidebar for a little story that's in the book. Um, this is when I almost got fired from my internship. Is there was a, a TV on in the bullpen, the old bullpen where all the interns cut clips and the producers made calls for their shows. And Brian Burke was on the TV. And someone jokingly said to me, oh, look, Brian Burke just resigned. And I went, what? Oh, my God, that's amazing. And I ran to the studio because I was going to get a coffee order anyway. And I told them, look up at the TV. Uh, Brian Burke is on. And I think the guest they had lined up was Steve Eiserman, I'm pretty sure. And they were going to hang up on him so that they could talk about the breaking wow. news of Brian Burke resigning. Wow. And I told them that instead of going straight to get the coffee, I went back into the bullpen just by chance. And I said, um, oh, I just told them. And everyone in the room goes, you to- told who what? What are you talking about? And I go, I told them that Brian Burke resigned. And they go, you fucking idiot. And like, and like they start buzzing everyone. And, blah, 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 and I ran down the hall and I told them because they were messing with me because mm-hmm. they knew I was a huge Leaf fan. But the what the press conference actually was, was Brian Burke holding a press conference to be like, I am not leaving the Ducks. Shortly after he left the Ducks. Yeah. <laughs> and then he joined the Leafs. So... Yeah, Doug Armstrong is under contract. Doesn't mean he always will be. Right. I'm simply saying, listen, I it's don't happened think before. Gonna, I don't think he's going to be GM of the Leafs. I don't. But it has happened before. Yes. Okay. Well, all this is to say that the real conversations sort of started this weekend, and right now they're set, they're lining up schedules and talking to people. And I wonder too. With the current makeup of the organization, how much of this is going to leak? Because a lot of it didn't leak before. But we know from Spezza immediately resigning. uh, We haven't talked about that. He immediately resigned when Dubas is gone. Those guys are so going to Ottawa. Um, uh, By the way, I had some DMs this weekend. uh, People uh, saying that one of the only topics or the only topic that Kyle Dubas follows is senators on Twitter. Now, I think he cleaned that out. sense fan. He grew up a Sens fan. Yeah. Now, the one thing I will say is I think the Sens and Dubas are a great match. Uh, based on what I've heard, they're going to have to up the salary of what the GM of the Ottawa hmm. Senators makes. Oh, yeah. I'm pretty sure he might be 32. Also, 32. Pure, <laughs> uh, the, their general manager must be like, well, what the fuck, man? <laughs> yeah, hey, <laughs> I'm, here. I'm still here, and I've put up with <laughs> bullshit. years of bullshit. <laughs> I had to put up with Pierre Maguire. Yeah, we're on the up. Yeah, I just got out from under Pierre Maguire phrasing. Snoop Dogg's going to buy us. And, and Snoop Dogg's going to buy I am, I want to work for Snoop Dogg. <laughs> Get this Kyle Dubas nonsense out of there. Yeah, poor Pierre Dorian. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I, here's what I want to say, too. And I said this on Friday, and I think it's important. Uh, Steve, how did you how did you describe Leafs Twitter this weekend? What would be you? Apoplectic. And then there was another one, feral. Feral. <laughs> I think that you don't have to like the way this went because I certainly don't. Uh, you also don't have to take sides either uh, because we don't know the whole story. Uh, you can root for Dubas and root for the Leafs. You can even root for Shanny. And if you're a Leaf fan, you're rooting for Shanny to make the right choices. Mm. You don't have to like what he did, but you you do have to root for him to make the right choices, don't you? And I'm rooting for that. And as my therapist likes to tell me, um, just because your brain goes to the worst case scenario does not mean the worst case scenario is actually about to happen. No. And as Leaf fans, you cannot be faulted for feeling like, holy fuck, here we are again. You can't be faulted for that. Nobody, nobody from the Leafs organization, nobody from another fan group, not even other Leaf fans can fault you for, truly fault you if they're being honest for going, oh, fuck. But you got to allow for this process to take place. You can react however you want to react. This could end up being good. Mm-hmm. It could be good for Kyle. It could be good for Brendan. And it could be good for you. Now, everybody else that's freaking out about Austin Matthews and signing the extension, guys, way too early. I don't even think they can sign him until July 1st anyway. I, I yeah. And, and the, the supposed text message, well, he may not want to sign if that came from his agent, Judd Moldover, Moldover, if that was the source on that, and I don't know that it was, um, of course, 
his agent is going to say, well, he's not sure if he's going to sign because the, 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 the signature is going to come when the dollar amount meets the expectation. Also, so what agent's going to go? Yep, he'll absolutely sign with the lease for sure. Just just make him an offer. Put whatever number down you want. Another Wasserman uh, agent recently said, yeah, we're not sure. <laughs> It cost the guy his job, but the other guy wasn't Austin Matthews. I, I, yeah. The, I think there was some confusion because people are talking like Elliot Friedman doesn't know that Matthews can't sign a contract before July 1st. I think he knows, fellas. Uh, <laughs> it's, But we all know how this works. There is tampering, quote unquote, although he's your own guy. Mm -hmm. I think there was an assumption that a framework would be in place by July 1st. And, and now it sounds like there won't be. But Unless there is with the number on it. Yeah. Come on. And I, yeah. I also want to say this. In the lease organization, Kyle Dubas tried to pull a power move. That's pretty clear. Kyle Dubas hasn't won anything. Whether that's his fault or the player's fault or the analytics fault or the or the or the punch to the face fault or the ref's fault, whatever you however you want to fault this, Kyle Dubas hasn't won anything. So Kyle Dubas tried, but ultimately found out that he did not have the type of leverage you need to have to change the organization structure. Austin Matthews, on the other hand, has far more leverage because he knows, as you do, that he's probably the best leap there's ever been. So he'll sign when the number's right. So anything you hear otherwise, he wants the team to win and he wants to have a chance at the cup and he wants the number to be right. If so, so you just said this could all work out. This could all work I'm out. I'm going to return to a question I asked. Mm -hmm. What's your confidence in it all working out? Well, it's low because I'm a Leaf fan. But things have done pretty well under Brendan Shanahan. Wouldn't you say? Things have only really gotten better under Brendan Shanahan. Wouldn't you say? I think the argument that Kyle Dubas hasn't won anything applies to the guy above him as I, well. They've created 100%. one of the single most difficult teams to evaluate in all of sports. <laughs> That's a How do you one. evaluate a team that is elite every regular season and shit the second the playoffs begin? Not shit. Shit the second a game that matters happens. <laughs> Games one through five and sometimes even six, they're great. Tampa, That Tampa series goes to seven. You think they win? Probably not. Probably not. At, it would have been at home too. Again. Oh, no. Oh no. Oh <laughs> no. Like they're they're the single most difficult team to evaluate. Uh like yeah, they're going to take a like next season when they take a regular season step backwards, I'm going to be like, yeah. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Apparently, the recipe for success is uh make the playoffs cuz Pittsburgh fucked a random Blackhawks game. Oh. Pittsburgh Dude, uh, they're they're the biggest loser in this whole they thing. Are. The Panthers shouldn't even be in the playoffs. And now here they are wrecking shop. But I guess we'll save that. For no, no, we can keep going. We can go into it right now if you want. To. You and don't want to talk to David Bastel? Oh, yeah, we got to talk to Dave. Okay, 90 great. minutes in our, our, our head coaching odds, our GM odds. I'm glad I mentioned them before. Let's talk to Dave and then let's talk about how Alex Lyon was starting the playoffs for the Florida Panthers. You can bet that with David Bastel. Brought to you by Sports Interaction. Get in the action and make a play. 19 plus. Please play responsibly. Okay, so we, 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 got, uh, we got this a little bit in at the beginning of the show, uh, but I do want to revisit it because the Leafs head coach and general manager are both available for a nice little prop bet uh, at uh, Sports Interaction on the on the on the app and on the website, and Dave, the list is a, you guys put a big list together, Dave. I was going to say, and it keeps on growing, Adam. You know, it, it's uh, <laughs> I, I think it's I think it's every single available coach, past and present, <laughs> since, since the early 1990s, uh, and exclusively here now. I will tell you this: we've added another member of this list. Steve Dangle, yeah! 201 to 1 at Sports Interaction. Come get some. 200 to 1. 
Two, that's it? Yeah. That's it. Dave. <laughs> Dave, what the hell? Yeah, Dave. Adam and I are sitting here as great candidates as well. <laughs> I hear you. I should at least be added to the GM conversation. Don't you feel? Come on now. <laughs> now, so, so Steve's on you the head You feel coach. like making a donation to Sports Center. Now, now, all of this <laughs> is, we don't even know if Sheldon Keefe is going to be let go. So this is the coach that immediately goes after Sheldon Keefe. Whether Correct. it's now or it's later, well, the, this is what okay, you're on. Okay, so... So the thought process is, and you guys have talked about this, is new general manager comes in, new general manager wants dot, 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 his coach. Right. Exactly. I'm, you know, it, it makes sense. And I, I it, okay, it is speculation, but yeah, it, it's exactly it. There is a, there is a situation where Sheldon Keefe very well could be coaching this team come uh, October, what is it going to be, 10th? Uh, but chances are likely that there will be a new head coach. So tell us who it's going to be. Uh, and as you guys mentioned, that list is uh, thorough, to I, say the least. I was I was laughing with someone about the list. Uh, we were talking about some of the unrealistic things on it. And I'm like, well, is it any more unrealistic than the Leafs hiring an 87-year-old Don Cherry? And then I looked it up, and he's actually 89. <laughs> I, I don't well, think he's, he's going to be I'm – not, I'm not putting $2 Steve on that. Uh, uh, the, the other thing no, 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 no. we got there is who will be the next GM. And the first three are the three that we sort of mentioned on the show uh, last week. Tree Living, Brandon Pridham, and Eric Tulski. Uh, what is hilarious is you threw on guys like Mike Keenan, Eric Lindros, and Doug Gilmore just because you never know, right? You never know. Yep. Could be a former player. Apparently, he's got a lot of phone calls are being made today. Mm -hmm. uh, I would, uh, I don't know. Like, true living seems like the sure thing. So I, I might take the coward's bet there, too. Here, here's what I don't understand. And we, we, I know we talked about this earlier, but like, this guy is the, he's just the candidate because, just because he's there, because he's a warm body who has GM experience. Yeah. Correct. I would yeah. take, and I also, I also am hearing that the tree living Tannenbaum friendship is hmm. very mighty. Oh. I'm just saying oh. it would make Jim Jim Tree Living obviously one Rich of the guys. Dude. Yes, so he would. Yeah, okay. I was gonna say and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, Scotia Bank Place is called Boston Pizza uh, Experience. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, maybe not. Maybe I like not. <laughs> Haley Wickenheiser at thirty to one though. She's the AGM special assistant, the AGM already. So I mean, you could do worse. Yeah, she's already oh, yeah, with the organization. Yeah. Anyway, you check them out right now. Uh, sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN. Dave, thanks so much for joining us as always. Thanks, guys. If you want a perfect beer in an obnoxiously large can that's independently owned, Skoka Brewery Tread Lightly might be for you. It's the new 568 milliliter tall can offering more liquid at great value so you can stay seated, seated on the couch and watch the Eastern and Western Conference Finals. I would say Steven on the couch. Steven on the couch. <laughs> uh, chicken wings, fries, juicy burgers. That's that's what they say to pair this stuff with, obviously, over the long weekend. Uh, Maddie gave it a shot. Maddie, how was it? Pretty good. So, yeah. Do I get to talk about my favorite part of the beer? Oh, sure. The percentage. Mm. 4%. The perfect percentage for beer. It is. Mm. It is. And it's also available in two fours and six packs at your favorite mm. beer sizes. You can buy it at uh, the grocery store. You can buy it at the beer store. Uh, and you can buy it at the LCBO. Grab Muskoka Brewery. It's independently owned and operated in the heart of Muskoka, employing a team of 120 strong, a true Canadian crafted beer. Tap room located in Bracebridge off of Highway 11 and 118. Fresh beer on tap to go and tours available uh, along with live music on the weekends in the summer. It's a beautiful patio. You should go check it out. Steve, you already did. Well, I did. And enough of your read. Listen, you ever try a light beer and it just tastes like yellow water? This doesn't. Oh, okay. It tastes like happiness and greatness. There you go. <laughs> check it out at your local beer store. I'm going to give you a stat, some stat lines. Are you ready? Mm. Three games played. One win. Two losses. 92 saves, nine goals against, a 3.26 goals against average, and a save percentage of 902. Hmm. Who am I speaking about? I think it's Alex Lyon. Remember at one point, the Florida Panthers were down and had to change their starting goaltender to their much maligned, questionable $10 million backup? Dude, the and he's the backup because Spencer Knight is out. Biden. Yes. Sergey Bobrovsky, I think, entered the playoffs as the third best goalie in the Panthers organization. He was 24 and 20 in the regular season. He had a 901 save percentage and a 301 goals against average. In the playoffs, he has as many losses as Alex Lyon did. 
<laughs> the, the Panthers' second most recent loss mm -hmm. was to Boston. Right. In the first round, game four. Now, this is the good news, Hurricanes fans. The Panthers are unbeatable, except they've lost both game fours. They there you lost go. to Boston and Toronto. So this is going five at very least. He is 10 and two in the playoffs. He has made 465 saves, 215 goals against average, a 935 save percentage. His regular season save percentage is 901. His regular season goals against average, 307. And he was 24 and 20 in 50 games for the Florida Panthers this year. 901 this year is like bang average on the low side of bang average. This guy is going to win the con Smythe. Easily. He may win the con Smythe and e even if Florida loses. Yeah. yeah. This could be a John Sebastian Jaguar situation. Although if if you're if you're bored, go look up what Jaguar did in that run in 2003 where they lost the cup but he won the con Smythe. They okay. they swept Minnesota. He almost shut them out the entire series. The first goal they scored on him was in game four. He was crazy. <laughs> I'm not making that up. Uh, that's that's crazy. He went 15 and six. One game, one win shy of the cup. A 162 goals against average, a 945 save percentage. Five shutouts. 945 with five shutouts. That's stupid absolutely stupid it might be what it's probably the best i mean do you is there a better goaltending performance all time not statistic loss um bobrovsky has been unbelievable and there's a lot of people leaf fans included who are like hey wait a second we did get goalie <laughs> so you know what's funny is uh i don't know what changes the bruins are going to make but it sounds like they're due for a retool of sorts right the leafs just fired their gm the Hurricanes are almost for sure going to lose their AGM, Eric Tulski. And as a friend of mine likes to say, AGMs do all the work. So maybe it's even worse mm -hmm. than losing your GM. The Panthers are not just wrecking shop on way to the Stanley Cup final, which they haven't earned yet. Mm -hmm. They still got to win that fourth game. But they're wrecking shop on way to the Stanley Cup final. And they're like ruining every franchise they play. Along the, the way, they're making everybody question everything. Reminds me of the 2011 Bruins. I, I said the Panthers were going to truck the Hurricanes, and I said in six. I said in six just because I felt stupid betting hard against the Hurricanes. Well, how could you? They're a this, great team. This Panthers team is insane. And you know what's hilarious is that uh, Carolina took five penalties throughout the game, last night's game. Uh, Panthers took two, and then the third one happened... Two minutes for roughing after the game expired. Which is why are you even thing. calling it? It's not a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they didn't call the Goss's bear penalty. I've been waiting for that, Steve. I mean, where's your rant? Where's your Edmonton Oilers were jobbed for the Carolina Hurricanes rant? How many times can you do that rant? <laughs> there was a there was a clear penalty at the end of regulation and. It wasn't called because that's how the game works these days. And yep. it's a shame that and, this is the National Hockey League. And people try to gotcha me. Mm -hmm. uh, where were you when uh, TJ Brody, high stick Brandon Hagel at the end of, I think that was game six. I said at the time, and I'm saying now, they got away with one. They should have called it. The Tampa Bay Lightning should have began the overtime of game six. Uh, with a power play in the same way that the Leafs should have began overtime of game five against the Panthers with a power play. They're just letting everything go. And what I said last night, and I can't believe the pushback I got, is the things that happen on the ice need to matter. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> like, they what do you don't. mean they don't? They don't need to, or you're saying they? No, they matter? they don't currently. Yeah, and everybody kind of knows that the things that happen on the ice don't matter and so far the number one argument against that appears to be way so <laughs> i think i might be right here uh -huh. um and y listen don't just talk to leaf fans there are lots of people i talk to who are in the sport who hate the leafs who are stunned by how little 
anybody likes the product. The one other dorky thing that I've seen out there is uh, uh, if the Panthers make it to the cup final, it'll be the fourth straight year that a Florida team is in the cup final and oh. <laughs> and the big hockey markets must hate that. I don't care about your hockey team. I'm upset that my hockey team is not in the Stanley Cup final, but I'm not like, ooh, ooh, I hope the team from Raleigh gets in instead. Ooh. Right. What? I don't give a shit, dude. I don't once the once the Leafs get eliminated, like fucking whoever can win. <laughs> I don't, I, I don't I, care. I'm just there for the entertainment. Yeah, yeah, yeah that point's story. so mute. It's the same thing with cheering for a Canadian team. Like, fuck that. That's not I'm not all of a sudden rooting for the Canucks because they're in the playoffs and the Leafs are out. That doesn't make sense. If I had one criticism of the Florida Panthers, uh, because you know, the call's going one way or another. The Panthers have nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. That's it's the officials and the league choosing yeah, but to not make calls. With with the with the Panthers getting the calls, it's like the Panthers are better at this than you. Oh yeah. Like all the you can't you can't complain about the Panthers getting away with stuff because they're they've just been the better team in every situation. And it's been fantastic to watch. And it whether they know how to play the system better or they're just more physical in the playoffs, which you can get away with, they're just better. The mm -hmm. one criticism I have, uh, and it's not an actual criticism, it's just I wish it were different, is they're too dominant. <laughs> like <laughs> Now that I have time to just sit back and, you know, watch hockey and whoever wins, wins. I mean, geez, you guys are rushing a little bit, don't you? Or d don't you think? Like, they're just, they're just mangling the competition. Um, same with Vegas, mm -hmm. actually. Are they up 2-0 or 3? 2-0. Okay, 2 Yeah, Yeah, tonight might be... If Aiden Hill keeps uh, playing like Sergei Bobrovsky, the series could be a quick one. Well, so, yeah, the only <laughs> thing I would say is like, geez, I like when it's a little close. So right I now, know they won two games in overtime. But in, like, in the NBA right now, the Lakers just got swept by the Denver Nuggets for nothing. The Miami Heat are up on the Boston Bruins three nothing. Celtics. Uh, Boston Bruins. Boston Celtics three nothing. In the NHL, the Florida Panthers are currently up three nothing in their series. And then the other side, Vegas is up two nothing. It is awful semifinals in the playoffs right now and tv's just been a waste well yeah, and like <laughs> it's it's teams that well at very least from a canadian perspective like no one's jacked about this final four at all so revenues were already going to be low and it's going by fast <laughs> mm -hmm, yeah <laughs> like if both vegas and florida sweep their series are they gonna start the cup final sooner they have a specific date the earliest it can start so it'll be on that date i don't know what i don't have offhand I think right CJ now CJ said it on our show and i can't remember yeah yeah there's a date that's like this is the first day the stanley cups and starts so it'll be that day so there'll be a little bit time off in between but uh carolina's played well this whole series yeah, they've like, been in it it's so many the couple overtime games like that can go any bounce but florida just always finds a way to pull it out and they've just had that little edge They've like it's not right away, man. I don't like the comparisons with the Leafs and Carolina in terms of how they've played Florida because Carolina didn't have that game three that the Leafs had. Yep. Oh, it's yeah. not. It's, oh, you're right. We're not. Yeah. It's not the same. It's apples and oranges here in terms of their competitiveness versus Florida. And just so we're not all high and mighty and giving them the Stanley Cup all of a sudden because Vegas and Dallas are in the West and they do do they do look really good. Um. The Sergei Bobrovsky, uh, Mr. Van Bries, Van Beersbrook comparisons mm -hmm. are completely fair because how did that playoff run end? Van Beesbrook. Oh, was he the goalie in John? Six? John Van Beesbrook. Van Beesbrook. Mm -hmm. uh, led the Florida Panthers to the uh, Stanley Cup Finals. Ninety six. Ninety six. Immaculate season. He had a nine thirty two. Over the course of those wow. games. Wow. Unreal run. With his weird little mask. Ended with a four game sweep at the hands of the Colorado Avalanche. It sure did. And a bunch of rats. Mm -hmm. I feel like the toy rats that they throw on the ice are smaller than they used to be. Mm -hmm. They used to be these big 30 pound <laughs> bastards. And goalies would like hide in their net to avoid getting hit by them. And Patrick was big tough guy moment because he's so weird. Um, was to just stand in his net and let rats pelt him. What I want to know is, is there a Florida Panthers fan forum 
featuring one or several people claiming to be the person who threw the rat that hit Wah in the head. <laughs> That's what I want to know. <laughs> yeah, which someone out the... there is like, I did that. Yep. It was my rat that hit him. If you don't know what I'm talking about, look it up. Look up Patrick Wah rats. That should be the only I, thing that you have to type. I, I'm curious to find out if this run is going to be the 2012 Kings or if it's going to be the 2020 Montreal Canadiens. Yeah. I want to play this uh, clip for you, uh, Rod Brindamore, after uh, the loss, uh, because I love Rod Brindamore's honesty. He almost seemed happy. Well, I think <laughs> he, he's got to at least be happy with how the team's played. Like, you, you, like, how do you, how, how could you not be? I get, like, as, as a coach, I think you're just like, did I do my job? And if you're Rod Brindamore, you did your job. Probably ought to feel like you did. Mm -hmm. Have a listen. That's been well. It's been three games. I mean, we can't do much more. I mean, we like how we're playing. Clearly, um, it's just we got to find a way to put one in. And then you know, I mean, defensively, we're giving up nothing. You know, really, in, in three games, we seventeen. You, you would have said to me. You got one of the highest, you know, the, the, the potent offenses you're playing, and you, you're giving them 20 shots a night. I mean, you'd be pretty happy with. Um, it's just we're, and we're creating offense. I think we hit, I don't know, felt like we hit a couple posts tonight. I mean, two or three, and we're. Is it just you know, It's there for us. It's just we gotta we gotta find a way to put it in. Didn't like. The, I think we had one power play maybe tonight. One or two. One. That, that's kind of strange in a game that we're dominating like that, but but we didn't do anything with it. You know that was bad. And then they had a couple power plays in a, in a row there. We did a decent job, and then obviously that's the difference in the game right there. One, I think it went off Slavo's stick too, which that's just the way things are going with for us this series. It's kind of you know we got to find a way to just break through and give ourselves a chance maybe to get back in this. But you know it's tough, like you said, because we have you know played really well. Here, here's the difference, I think, is there's reason to believe if you replayed those three games, Carolina could also be up 3 nothing. Sure. Mm -hmm. Of um, course. Or it could be 2-1, 1-2, whatever. Mm -hmm. If you replayed the first three games of the Leafs-Panther series, <laughs> I think best case scenario, it's 2-1 Cats. Mm -hmm. I think Carolina's got a lot to be happy about with their play. Like, as you said, all you can do is coach. And then, and then the players just kind of see how the puck bounces and they've done a terrific job in the series and then just hasn't gone their way. And that's to the credit of the Florida Panthers and their relentlessness and the unbelievable goaltending they're getting from Bobrovsky. Yeah. Am, am I misreading the discourse or are there some people who think that the Panthers prolific nature in these playoffs is all their goalie? So it doesn't count. No, no, I don't think there's people. Well, no. That. Is it? Ah, no one's just, making ah, it. Ah, Carolina's getting goalied and the Leafs are getting goalied. No, there's, there's people trying to make excuses for the Leafs based on how f dominant Florida has been versus Carolina. Teams have goalies. Yeah. And also, like, <laughs> I think we got a good view of this this season with the amount of goalies who the Leafs had to use and their different styles. And, uh, you know, goalies make your team look good, they make coaches look good. But I think uh, defenses that match their goalie. Um, like, I, I mean, defenses can really set up their goalies for success. And, you know, is, is, is Bob extremely good? Is Bob going above and beyond in terms of helping his team to win? Yeah. But how many miracles is he pulling off? I guess is what I'm asking, right? He's not the only reason for their success is all I'm saying. And it, I think, when people just go, ah, goalies, and they throw up their arms. I think that's really weird. Mm -hmm. They're allowed. Goalies are allowed to go off. And it doesn't mean that your information doesn't count. But it also doesn't mean right off the Florida Panthers. They're, I promise you if the Panthers win the cup, they're going to hand out more than one ring. <laughs> On the other side, I heard uh, Friedman Elliott bring up Sean Burke in uh in vegas and the jobs he's doing oh. there there's a great oh. there's a awful situation with a great goalie coach who's able with along with bruce cassidy and the system they got there to get the most out of their goalies and you had during the regular season laurent brassois aiden hill uh patera thompson and quick 
all goaltenders who started throughout the year for the Vegas Golden Knights, all above a safe percentage of 900 because of the great system that they run there and their defense. And Sean Brooke, who's their goalie coach, doing a great job. And Aiden Hills just stepped in for Brassois and hasn't missed a beat and has arguably been better. Well, and both of them stepped in for Logan Thompson. And yeah. I thought Logan Tom like uh, this team without Logan Thompson would be cooked mm -hmm. a few months ago. I so, honestly don't think that now. I think the point is that goalies are a part of your team mm -hmm. and you're allowed to develop and have a great system that can support your goalie and also have a good goaltender and you can win that way and that's allowed. Well, and <laughs> other players are allowed to step their game up. Yeah. You're also allowed to <laughs> fluke your way. Like, let's be honest. Uh, uh, sometimes you have a goalie that gets hot. Uh -huh. and, and, and he feels great. And he feels great. And, he's, and, and, and not fluke, I guess. I guess that's the wrong word, but uh, I... We have seen this before in the playoffs. We mentioned Jaguar. We mentioned the Kings. We meant, and the Kings, by the way, went, proved it wasn't a fluke and won it again a couple years the later. The Ducks couldn't score. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. It was just Jaguar would close the door until someone found it. And, you know, how many overtimes do you need tonight, boys? Three? All right. Keith Carney up the, up the boards to LeClaire. Don't take this Steve away. Steve Thomas. Yeah. Don't take this away from the Panthers. I think this is these stories are the ones that we this is why the playoffs are special. Because something completely unexpected happens every freaking year. Every year. This is exciting. You should enjoy it. And I think Vegas, by the way, uh Vegas being up 2 0 should not go unnoticed as well, man. Like that, that that team is Man, Jesse, you so nailed it. Like in the first round, it's like they're sort of mid at everything, and yet they're great altogether. That makes them great. Being, all this. being just decent at every single aspect of the game has has just done them wonderful in the playoffs. And that's kind of how you got to win. And But with Carolina, when we sat here in the Leafs, we're down 3-0 to the Florida Panthers. We didn't write the obituaries for uh, the Leafs until they officially lost that fourth game in game number five. So let's not mm. rule out the 100%, miracles 100%. On e for either the Stars. Like, Stars wouldn't even be a miracle. They, they're they just down 2-0. And Carolina, they could always pull off a Boston Red Sox and come back from 3-0 down. Who knows? I do want to say one more thing about Jaguar. And this this is so dead puck era. So the Anaheim Mighty Ducks, because that's what they were called at the time, mm -hmm. played 21 games. Who was their highest scorer and how many points did they have? Gets laugh. Rob No, Niedemeyer. he was drafted that year. Nah. Well, sorry. I'll, <laughs> I'll give you the score. It was Adam Oates, but in 21 oh. games, how many points did he have? What year is this? 2003. Oh, my God. You went far back. That's, that's when he won the Conn Smythe, despite not winning the Cup. 15. What? 13. 13 Oh, points. my gosh. Their leading score. Goal scorer had seven in three assists. Someone else had six. No one else had five. Wow. How? How? I think that's a lot of credit to their head coach, Mike Babcock. <laughs> what are what he's doing? <laughs> Mitch Marner had 12 points against the Lightning. Yeah. <laughs> to give you an idea. Yeah. <laughs> Holy Man, the was, was Babcock on the odds for coach? No. No. No, they didn't no, even do it for fun, like a 200 to 1 or something. They should have. They That's have. a fun. That would have been <laughs> stupid. Uh, by the way, I should mention that as the show is taking place, the Flames have uh, officially hired Craig Conroy to be their general manager. Brad Pascal gets uh, promoted to vice president of hockey ops and. Lee fans know him well. Dave Nonis will be the senior vice president of hockey operations and assistant GM. Wow. Yeah, I mean, people can grow and learn. Yeah, he's sort of been out of it for a while. I mean, he was with Anaheim for a while, right? Just in the in behind the scenes, mm -hmm. like AGMing and that's yeah. I I'm not going to read too much into that. I mean, uh, Flames fans are jacked about Craig Conroy, so I would focus on that. And you know, uh, Dave Nonis, I'm sure, is capable of being a good assistant GM. He, I mean, he might be another one of those guys who was good at the AGM job, but bad at the GM job. Do you want to tell your favorite story you like telling every couple of years on the podcast about the potato versus Dave, Dave Nonas in Vancouver? Oh, man. On the Plan puppets. Uh, was it Dave Nonas versus a potato? Is that, what is, that, is that not what the blog was? Where they had a potato as... So they set up... <laughs> the writers at Canucks Army set up a bot called Sham Sharon, was <laughs> which I always thought was set up by Cam Sharon, but it was just in homage of their buddy. 
And basically, they took a look at the Canucks during Nonus's tenure, I think. And they did... Who would do better, Dave Nonus or a potato, in terms of drafting? So a potato cannot sign guys or whatever cannot trade cannot sign free agents and the potato automatically selects the highest scoring major junior player with the next pick it can't <gasps> go off the board and they took the down player. the article no what? the original oh. article i went to go click it because you could still uh, click to the link and it's down damn it <laughs> so basically it's but basically, there were a few picks that Dave Nonis nailed, but for the most part, the potato that simply drafted the highest scoring major junior player who is available. So that that also eliminates European free agents. Yeah. Or, or sorry, European draftees, uh, like college guys. And it mopped the floor with Dave Nonis's actual record. Wow. Like one of the guys they could have picked was like Claude Giroux. It was, it was bad. <laughs> it, it was bad that's rough that sucks that we're not able to post that yeah they have like one where they did uh shamshron takes over all 30 draft tables how did he do and in this article it links to some of the if a potato could do better if a uh, potato named shamshron blah blah and the explaining ones and they go on to 404 page oh page not found art uh, you know what? landing pages i think we're confusing two articles because there was one that did the Canucks, not just Dave Notice, it was the Canucks draft record versus a potato. Mm -hmm. Or versus, no, 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 it wasn't versus a potato. It was the Canucks draft record versus Sham Sharon. And then it was Dave Notice as a GM versus a potato. And it's just, you have to re-sign guys at their qualifying offer. Mm -hmm. Or something like that. It was, uh, anyway, Dave Notice lost. Wow. <laughs> to, uh, to a potato. <laughs> but... People can change and they can learn and they can embrace new things. This yes. was the analytics era when it was just coming in and, and, uh, and you know, the Leafs were famously against it and their fans were crying for them to be for it. And Shani took over and then Dubas eventually came in with Mark Hunter and then Lou Lamorello and the rest is history. Now, um, I want to quickly uh, just say that it was fun to see Bruce Boudreaux on WWE last night. That was really cool. That was very cool. He continues to be just the coolest guy. Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn and Brucey just living his best life. Yeah, love it. Love it for Brucey. He deserves it. You know what? We'll wrap it up there because we have another show coming tomorrow. So we're right back at it. Cool. We'll, we'll talk about other shit, I guess. Uh, nah. <laughs> no, we'll spend the whole time talking about the Leafs. We got Vegas and Dallas tonight. We'll see because every team that's won in this series has not lost. <laughs> Shut up. That's mind blown. That's every good. team that has won in in the in the eastern and western finals has not lost um we'll see if that asshole. record changes tonight Shit. are we gonna get a double sweep have we ever had one of those oh it's a good must have good question must have. i feel like uh sweeps really went out of style but like in the 90s oh there's sweeps all the time loved a good sweep yeah yeah me too Do you guys care about the tv ratings discourse it feels like this year there's more of the oh these teams are bad for tv ratings. i'm oh. like I don't care. I don't, I'm gonna watch the hockey either way. It's bad hockey if they're up three. I'll still watch. I don't know. The, the uh, Florida Panthers fans sure showed up last night, there, and they've been they've been loud. I I I have to be honest, man. Like uh, the TV part for the business, it's a story because it's the business. But if you're a fan, why do you give a shit? Yeah, right. Like I I think um I think it's great. We know hockey can work in Florida because it does in Tampa. As someone who works so, there, I, I do not expect fans to be like, oh man. I hope Rogers' revenues recover from this. Yeah, it's weird that like, I don't expect you because if you shit. care about the TV ratings, like oh, this matchup is bad for TV ratings, so you are also like sympathetic to these big corporations making an extra. Well, dollar. I think Here's a lot of the people saying it are working for those big corporations and well, are hoping that, for big names to get through. So maybe that's where it's coming from. I think sure. people also want the fucking cap to go up. Yeah, and, okay. and to that I would just say yeah. you have no control over that. Yeah, that's that's up to G bets, and uh, he's not gonna let it go up. I don't think this year. Bummer, bummer. Yeah, but it could go up by as much as ten. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's uh, uh, let's call it a day. Let's call it a day. Have some candy. Yeah, you want some candy? There's, did you buy the Sour Patch Kids? Yep. 
We got Sour Patch Kids and M and M's now. <gasps> we have M&M's. where are the M and M's? I gotta put them in the container. Oh, oh there. that's yeah, amazing. The Steve Dangle Podcast, powered by Sports Interaction. Want to bet? Follow the guys on Twitter at Steve underscore Dangle at Adam W Y L D E and at Jesse Blake. Connection complete.